All of us know about Alexander the Great. After all his achievements and name have been etched throughout the annals of history. He is known for many battles, but some of them just seem to stand out. Hello and welcome to the History Channel. Southeast Asia has many rulers come and go, and it has also been the target of many foreign powers. Well, today we are going to talk about one such ruler and an invader who usurped his throne. Yep, we are going to talk about King Porus and Alexander the Great. Without any ado, let's dive into the video. Porus, also known as Poros or Puru in Sanskrit, was a member of the Puru dynasty, which was known in both India and Iran and is thought to have originated in Central Asia. The clan families belonged to the Parvatiya mountaineers recorded by Greek authors. Porus reigned over the Punjab region between the Hydaspes, Jhelum, and Akasines rivers, and he is first mentioned in Greek literature in relation to Alexander. After his third devastating defeat at Gaugamela and Arbela in 330 BCE, the Persian Achaemenid Emperor Darius III begged Porus for assistance in defending himself against Alexander. Instead, Darius's troops assassinated him and joined Alexander's armies, fed up with losing so many wars. In 327 BC, Alexander launched a fresh expedition to further extend his kingdom into India after defeating the last of the Achaemenid Empire's armies in 328 BC. Alexander began his assault of India through the Khyber Pass after fortifying Bacteria, modern-day Afghanistan, with 10,000 troops. The main Greek column crossed the Khyber Pass, but a smaller force led by Alexander went through the northern route, taking the fortress of Aornos, modern-day Pirsar, along the way. A mythologically significant location for the Greeks because Heracles had failed to occupy it during his campaign in India, according to legend. Now, before we get into the events of the battle, let us first clear the exact location of this conflict. The fight took place in what is now Pakistan's Punjab state on the east bank of the Hydaspes River, now known as Jhelum, a tributary of the Indus. Later, Alexander constructed Nicaea, a city on the battleground that has yet to be identified. Any attempt to locate the old battleground is hopeless because of the profound changes in the area. For the time being, the most likely site is immediately south of Jhelum, where an old main route crossed the river, and a Buddhist source cites that a city that may be Nicaea. Whatever the location, the battle was one of the most difficult battles that Alexander had to fight. So, let's see how it all turned out. Alexander's initial march across India was relatively unopposed, and he gained a lot of supporters in the process. He dispatched an emissary to Porus in the hopes of averting a conflict with the Indian monarch, but the arrogant king refused to pay tribute and warned Alexander that he would meet him in combat. He was confident, feeling that the river itself, which was nearly a mile wide, deep and fast moving, was his best protection, unlike the river Granicus. The monsoon season and melting Himalayan snow would have expanded it much more by the time Alexander arrived. Porus assumed and hoped that Alexander would either have to wait until the rainy season ended before crossing or quit his quest and depart. He stationed his troops in a defensive posture along the river and waited for the Macedonians to arrive. While precise numbers vary, Porus is thought to have had between 20 and 50,000 soldiers, over 2,000 cavalry, up to 200 elephants, and over 300 chariots. Alexander would face an army that outnumbered him 
as he had in past fights, but this never seemed to bother him. Porus, however, had misjudged the young Macedonian king's intellect. Alexander set up camp immediately across from Porus on the west side of the Hydaspes, as Porus had predicted, and gave every sign that he would wait until the monsoon season was through, even having massive food supplies sent in from his Indian ally, the King Taxila, also known as Memphis. He, on the other hand, had no intention of waiting. Alexander had recruited support from several of the nearby Rajaks, including Taxila, in order to prepare for the coming fight, a move Alexander had hoped would enrage Porus. Alexander was similarly well prepared when he arrived in the Hydaspes. He had recruited more men from several of the Persian provinces he had conquered before advancing into India, educating them in the Macedonian manner of combat, which had enraged the seasoned Macedonian warriors. Finally, he added Scythian horse archers, foreshadowing Porus' employment of elephants. Porus was prepared and wading across the river with his army of elephants, cavalry, infantry, and six-man chariots. Two charioteers or mahouts, two shield-bearers, and two archers made up the six-man squad. Porus felt he had the upper hand. All he had to do was hold his defensive position, protect the finest possible crossing points, and butcher Alexander's troops as they crossed the river. However, if the Macedonians crossed successfully, they would have to fight his elephants. Elephants were introduced to the West for the first time, although others believe elephants were already at Gaugamela. While elephants are good against horses, as they usually incite fear in them, they are tough to handle and panic frequently. Nonetheless, Alexander and others would utilize them in future conflicts, notably the great Carthaginian Hannibal. Porus remained optimistic that Alexander would just give up and go. Some historians say Porus doubted his ability to beat the Macedonians. He'd get his opportunity to find out soon enough. After a lengthy and exhausting search, a good crossing spot was discovered around 18 kilometers from the Macedonian camp near a river bend, a highly forested region that would be ideal for providing cover. Alexander and his army were ready, despite the fact it was late dark and a severe rainstorm was raging. Alexander left Craterus in camp with a sufficient army and orders not to cross himself until later to keep Porus uninformed of his crossing. According to legend, Alexander dispatched a soldier dressed as the king to further perplex Porus. Alexander took part in the companion cavalry, mounted archers, and various infantry units under the command of Hephaestion, Perdiccas, and Demetrius with him. The crossing was supposed to happen in three stages. To cross the river safely, Alexander built rafts out of tents and used the 30 galleys and boats left over from his Indus River crossing. He was accompanied by around 15,000 cavalry and 11,000 infantry. The crossing, however, did not go as easily as he had imagined. Instead of reaching the opposite coast, Alexander landed on a vast island in the middle of the river, which shocked him. His army would have to wade across the island to the opposite side. Of course, there is considerable debate as to whether Alexander was aware of the island. It may have been by accident or by intent. Many people do not believe Alexander could have missed the existence of such a big island. Alexander reorganized his troops into battle shape and prepared for his confrontation with Porus after arriving at the coast before daybreak. Because Alexander was hesitant to have his cavalry advance without protection, the companion cavalry was stationed in front of the infantry, 
not all of the infantry had crossed. They would join Alexander later, while the mounted archers served as a defensive screen against the elephants ahead of the cavalry. Porus's scouts had already seen Alexander cross the river and had notified the Indian monarch of his approach. Porus was preparing a retaliation. Porus dispatched his son with 3,000 troops and 120 chariots in a failed attempt to delay Alexander. Porus's attempt was a complete failure. The son was killed and the cavalry and chariots were decimated. The few survivors escaped to Porus. Alexander moved six miles to the Indian camp where he would wait for the rest of his men to come without waiting for the extra infantry to cross. After the initial defeat, Porus started to prepare his own army for the battle. He placed his best weapon, the elephants on the front line, ahead of his infantry. The Indian cavalry was stationed on the right and left flanks, with the six-man chariots providing cover. Porus, astride his elephant, stood in the middle. Alexander used many of the same tactics that had proven successful in his previous campaigns in Greece and Persia. Alexander, stationed on the right, employed the companion cavalry to assault Porus's flanks, while his horse archers battered the elephants with arrows, according to most accounts. Porus's right flank was attacked by Conus, whose starting location is unknown while Alexander attacked his left wing. Porus dispatched his cavalry from the right to loop around and assist his left against Alexander in a defensive move. Porus then dispatched his elephants against the Macedonian phalanx while waiting for aid from his ally, King Abyssaries of Kashmir. The horse archers struck with a hail of arrows. The infantry slowly retreated back without breaking ranks. Unfortunately for the Indian army, the elephants panicked and revolted, injuring Porus's own troops more than Alexander. Conus, meanwhile, rounded Porus's back and assaulted his left flank from behind. Porus's army charged right into Craterus, who had already crossed the river, killing 12,000 Indians and 80 elephants while just 1,000 Macedonians were killed. Despite sustaining grievous wounds, King Porus stayed on his elephant throughout the battle, startled to see his troops escape, but unable to concede defeat and surrender. Porus stated that he wanted to be treated like a king when Alexander approached the proud, beaten monarch and inquired how he would like to be treated. Because of this, Alexander promised Porus that he would stay king as long as he owed devotion to Alexander. In addition to this, Alexander gave Porus additional land to control. Not all Indians, however, embraced their new status as subjects of a Westerner. A relative of Porus declared himself king of Paurava and was so also known as Porus and resumed the fight in the country's east. When Alexander's army marched up the Ganges Valley, he escaped, most likely to the kingdom of Magadha. Alexander proceeded on to the Indian Ocean from Hydaspes. Sadly, he would not be accompanied by his beloved Bucephalus on his final march. He had lost his magnificent horse, who had been with him since his childhood, either to old age, he was past 30, or war wounds, according to reports. Bucephala, a city named after Alexander, would be built in his honor. Alexander's march to the sea, however, would not be without difficulty. His soldiers eventually defeated the monarch and persuaded him to come home. According to accounts, Alexander was so upset by his men's reluctance at first that he shut himself up in his tent and hurled himself on the ground. However, the sensible persuasions of his companions, as well as the pleas and laments of his warriors, 
finally convinced him to return. In 323 BCE, Alexander returned to Babylon, where he died. For the following three decades after his death, his massive kingdom would be the focus of a series of successor wars. Following Alexander's death, Porus was acknowledged as protector of the eastern boundary under the supervision of the Satrap Pathan of Punjab when his successor, Periticus, partitioned the lands. When the Satrapis were separated for the second time after Perdiccas' death, he was still in charge of the settlement at Triparadisus. Pathan, the satrap of Medea, not to be confused with the former Pathan, one of Alexander's successors, attempted to conquer the leaders of the eastern provinces in 317. The other satraps banded together to provide for the opposition. Eudemus, the leader of the Macedonian army at Texila, was one of them. He assassinated Porus in order to obtain his elephants. The king of Magadha, Sandrakidas, Chandragupta Maria, was able to capture the Indus Valley after the murder of a loyal ruler and his warriors. Less than 10 years after the invasion, the Macedonian Empire in the east came to an end. So that was all the time we had today, folks. Hope you enjoyed this video. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel and do hit the bell icon to receive an instant notification every time we upload a new video. See you all next time.